Oh, is this on? It is. It is? It's so quiet. Is it loud enough? Can you all hear me? It's so funny. It doesn't sound like it's on. All right. Welcome back um, for the second half of our 2023 Summer Systematics Institute presentations. Um, we're so excited to hear from the rest of our cohort. Um, we did a little intro this morning about the program, but for those of you who are joining us just for the afternoon, we wanted to kind of do a little shortened version of a little background of this program. So this is the 28th year of the Summer Systematics Institute. So the folks that you're hearing from today join like a huge group of folks who have, have trained here at the Academy. Um, and it's been a real joy to work with all of these incredible people um, this summer. Our interns have worked closely with a scientific mentor to a group of mentors, but one, they've worked in one main lab over the summer, each of them, and have done really interesting and important research that you'll hear more about. Um, they've also had field trips and workshops and done and had tours of our collections and really learned about kind of everything that happens at a natural history museum, the kind of research that we do, the kind of scientific communication that we do, and have really honed their skills um, that are needed to be a natural history museum scientist in the 21st century. Um, now I'll turn it over to Lauren to do a start of some things. So this is by no means an exhaustive list of thank yous, but we wanted to just thank a, a few people that have been really instrumental in the success of this summer. Um, the first is our, our sort of first ever student um, lecturer, Dr. Ed Myers, sitting right up here in the front, who guided them through everything they needed to know. Uh, also a huge thanks to SSI alum, uh, Jacob. Gorno and Kate Montana, who uh, were super instrumental in making sure that the summer went off without a hitch, uh, and also teaching our interns a bit about science writing and science presenting. Um, a big thanks to the CCG, our genetics lab, without which a lot of these projects would have simply been impossible, uh, to all the collection managers and curators and other guest lecturers who spoke to our students over the course of our um, seminar series throughout the summer uh, to our science communications department and digital engagement department who tr provided some training in, in science writing and digital communication. Um, who am I missing here? There's so many people. It's like it takes a whole museum to raise an SSI, I guess, is the answer. <laughs> uh, but I'm really excited to share these, this last set of, of talks with you, the second half of talks. Um, today, this, this is really the culmination of 10 weeks of really hard work. Uh, I think a lot of these folks entered day one not having even any idea about what they'd be doing for the summer in some cases or what they'd be studying. Uh, and as I think you'll hear from the rest of these talks today, they are leaving fully fledged scientists or science communicators or science illustrators. Uh, <laughs> and um, we couldn't be prouder of them and we think you're going to love what they have to say. All right, so uh, I'm going to invite up our first speaker this afternoon. Uh, that is Delson Hayes, who's joining us. <laughs> who's joining us from the University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, and his advisor this summer was Dr. Allison Gould. Can you hear me OK? Is this audible? Good. Okay, excellent. So before we begin, um, we're working with a photos, uh, a bioluminescent bacterium, and we have two little black boxes that contain some live ones that you can be passed around. You can look in them and see them glow. Um, yeah, okay. So hello, my name is Delson Hayes. Um, I'm currently about to be a fourth year at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, obviously, I'm an SSI intern here this summer, and we looked at this really interesting um, biological system it is composed of um, a common fresh or not a marine fish and a bioluminescent symbiont bacterium. Okay, so before we really need to talk about like the nitty gritty of this system, we should just cover the basics with bioluminescence. Um, it's an extremely widespread phenomenon with fish alone. There's uh, over 1,500 species that we see this in. Um, it's evolved independently 30 and probably more times than that. Um, and because of a lot of different 
uh, factors. It's very difficult to study. Um, a lot of deep sea fish are bioluminescent, and it's not a common phenomenon in shallower waters, which means collecting these animals is hard. Keeping them alive in the lab environment is virtually impossible. Um, and also, importantly, there's a couple different ways this can happen. Bioluminescence can be symbiotic, where a fish has um, bacteria that live inside of it that produce light, or it can be intrinsic, where the fish produces light itself. We're going to be looking at a symbiotic example. Um, this is our model system. It's wonderful. We're using some fish called Cephamia. Um, it's relatively easy to study because these are naturally shallow water species. We don't have to go down like a mile to collect them. You can just go to the beach in Sydney in some cases. Um, it's an extremely specific association. There are quite a few different species of Cephamia, but they all rely on one bacterium so far as we know at this point. Um, they're also found in a diversity of habitats. Cephamia can be tropical, temperate, subtropical. Um, and we don't really know if that habitat diversity corresponds with bacterial diversity. We know it corresponds with fish diversity. We don't know if it extends to the bacteria again yet. Um, so a quick overview of these fish. There are 28 species. They're called siphon fish, which is kind of a misnomer because they don't have a siphon. Um, they have a tubular organ that contains the bacteria that we used to think was a siphon because we saw it and just kind of like took a shot in the dark. We were wrong. Um, it's a highly divergent genus within its family. It doesn't really have any close relatives at all. Um, as of, I think, this year, maybe last year, there are 28 species. There was a new one recently. Um, and only one has really ever been looked at in any degree of detail. It's called Cephamia tubifer. It's the tropical variety. It's pretty, pretty widespread. But this paper is um, kind of exciting, or this project is exciting, because we're looking at two new ones, Cephalides and Rosiogaster, which are not tropical. These are temperate or subtropical. Um, and we don't have any idea what kind of symbionts they use. So that's, that's a big part of our project is figuring out what make them glow. Uh, I don't suppose anybody wants to take a shot at pronouncing this name. Um, this is Photobacteria mandipimensis. We've said that a lot in the last 10 weeks. Um, so far as we know, it's the only symbiont in Cyphamia, again, at this point. Um, it's naturally bioluminescent. There's a whole enzymatic process that isn't really germane right now, but it's cool. Um, it's a facultative fish endosymbiont, which means that it's naturally found in seawater or on surfaces. It's just kind of out and about, but it can be taken up by fish and then housed in their light organs. Um, it is a member of this family called Vibrionaceae. Has anybody heard of Vibrio before? Yep. <laughs> um, so that's uh, one Vibrio species is responsible for causing cholera. Um, same family. And just as... Cephamia only uses this one bacterium. Only one strain has been found in Cephamia. So again, it's extremely, extremely specific. So this is where things are going to get a little dense. Um, we have a lot of methods to talk about. Before I arrived at this lab, um, specimens were collected. And there's a whole bunch. We didn't come anywhere near to using all of the ones that were collected. But these fish were collected from, I believe, the Philippines and Australia, maybe some other locations. Um, the fish were euthanized, the light organ was removed, and then the bacteria were sort of cultured out of that light organ and then frozen at a negative 80 C uh, cooler. Um, when I started, my, my first task was doing some DNA extractions from these isolated cultures. Um, we don't really need good extractions, we just need enough for us to do what's called PCR fingerprinting, which is the product is what you're seeing here, this gel. Um, basically, once we have, in our case, we use 56 samples, we would use Eric PCR to break them into fragments, run them on a gel, and then the bands you get are like a fingerprint that tell you what strain you have. So you see the first two columns here have more or less the same band pattern, which indicates that they are probably the same strain, whereas third and fourth are very different. Um, and then we looked at this and we selected 24 unique strains based on our band patterns to best cover this total diversity of, um, of all the strains we had. The reason we chose 24 is because I think that's the number we can use on a nanopore and using more than one nanopore is very expensive. Using one nanopore is very expensive. Um, so of our 24 samples, we used eight Cephamia cephalides, um, 11 Cephamia roseogaster, and five S. tubifer. Tubifer is a tropical one. It's one we've already studied pretty thoroughly. Um, you can see on this map where we got them from. Tubifer is up in the Philippines. And then our 19 sort of tropper, subtropical to temperate species are from Sydney, like 
basically the same area um, in very close proximity to one another. So once we had chosen our 24, we um, took the original frozen extract and we started culturing it on solid medium. We would then isolate a single colony from that, transfer it to a li liquid incubation tube, and then basically pellet that down so you just have a mass of bacteria. Next thing, we do more DNA extractions, this time only 24, and we're doing high molecular weight, which basically is just a fancy way of saying we want bigger chunks of DNA. We don't want like smaller tidbits. We want long contiguous pieces because that makes it much easier to assemble a total genome. Um, and then we would take a barcode, which is sort of just a unique strand of, of A's, C's, G's, and T's that we stick on the end of each of our 24 samples so that we can distinguish them after they've been sequenced. Um, and we have to do that because after you've done all of this like meticulous weeks of manually collecting things, keeping them separate, labeling everything like a million different letters, you just dump them in one little tube together, which is a little counterintuitive and terrifying. Um, but I guess it's how it goes. Um, we then ran this one tube on an Oxford Nanopore Minion kit for about 36 hours. Um, I assume some people here know how that goes, but for those who don't, it's really cool. Basically, there is a, a sheet that contains a whole bunch of pores, and the DNA that you're running through it will get split in half, and then one end will get passed through that pore, like this diagram shows. And the A's, C's, G's, and T's all have different electrical charges. And so the machine that this is plugged into will read those differences in charges as different base pairs, which leads us to this really terrible slide that's just kind of inevitable because we have to talk about bioinformatics. Um, I don't really want to go into the full depth of this because we'll be here until seven. But um, the long and short of it is that we have this file that is electrical signals and we take that, turn it into ACs, Gs and Ts. So it's a nice readable nucleotide sequence. We filter out the little ones that don't really tell us much. We sort of clean it up. There are some things that just nanopore introduces as errors or artifacts of sequencing. And we can kind of um, clean that up a little bit with a couple of these different programs. Um, we then compare our sequences with the reference genome that tells us basically with what we've got, how does this map to what we know Amanda Pimensis, uh, a bacterial genome looks like. And then we can compare the genome nucleotide similarity. And the, the whole end result of this is that we can get a really nice picture like this. Um, photobacterium Amanda Pimensis is nice because it has exactly two chromosomes um, and they're circular, so they actually look like this. Basically, what we're seeing here is the whole genome of P. Amanda Um And specifically, this is the alignment of a reference genome with eight of our samples. We chose eight that looked pretty good, that had high quality scores. Um, and you can see each ring is a different genome. So red is one, orange is one, yellow is one, and so on. Basically, what this shows us is that there is a presence absence for like each gene across this whole genome where you see like the white spots, that's a missing gene. So we can look at this and say, all right, you know, some of these map really well, but some, if you look at chromosome two, there's sort of like the turquoise one, it's kind of, we're really only expecting to see like one genus, one species, one subspecies, one strain, we really shouldn't be seeing that much error. So if you look into that a little further, we're making one of these things, this is like maybe the weirdest one to explain, but it's a, it's a grid basically of all of our samples on both axes and it's a, a comparison. We compare every sample to every other sample to see how similar they are. Um, the dark red indicates very, very close. That's like nearly identical, could probably even be the same colony. Orange is like related, but you know, probably a different um, distinct lineage, but still the same bacterium. Where you see white and yellow, it's not very good and gray is like no relation whatsoever. So we can see here is that we have like this one really clear chunk. It's like the, the bulk of the diagram at the top left. Um, and then we have like the secondary thing going on at the, at the bottom there. Um, that doesn't seem like it should be there. It's a really perplexing result that we got to play a little bit with. I should also say on here that like the top rectangle is our phylogeny. <laughs> um, what happened is that we were really only expecting to get P. mandipimensis. And we got something else that is so different that it crunched our entire phylogeny into like a horizontal line. Um, so what we did to remedy that is we took those two groups and we ran them as independent phylogenies. Um, these are color coded. 
obviously, for each lineage that we ended up with. On the left, we have that weird little outlier clade that was sitting at the bottom right, the things that shouldn't really, in theory, be there. And we figured out, lo and behold, these are Vibrio. Um, this is not the, the species that associates with these fish. They're not really documented to ever occur uh, in the light organs of these fish. And they're a particularly diverse group that we can well, talk about. But they're interesting because they are often um, pathogenic, like cholera. They can also just be kind of environmental, just out and about in the water. And sometimes, in theory, they could be bioluminescent and potentially symbiotic. Um, whether or not that's the case, we'll get to that. Um, on the right side, we have the Photobacteria mandipimensis tree. This is what we expected to see. Like, this is just, in theory, we would only have this tree. That's kind of what makes our results exciting. Um, and this shows basically which of our different samples have which strains. So in the nomenclature here, I don't know if it's, I hope it's legible, but SR stands for Cephamia rosigaster, SC is Cephamia cephalides, and ST is Cephamia tubifer, the three different species of fish. And really strangely, we have monophyletic lineages for the two new species. So all of the bacteria from rosigaster have a common ancestor, and all of the bacteria from cephalides have a common ancestor, which is really strange because it indicates that these fish have extremely, like extremely high uh, host specificity when they're picking their symbiont bacteria. Um, oh, and I should say as well, for the Vibrio tree, we were able to figure out the identity of three of our four stray Vibrios. So the two down there at the bottom, which are SC-12-1 and SC-12-21, is a recently described species called Vibrio jacicida. Nobody in our lab knows how to say that word. Um, but it's, it's a pathogen. Usually it infects like lobsters and fish. Um, the red one in the middle, which is marked with a 2, I think that's uh, SC1618, is Vibrio oensii, which is pretty much always a pathogen as well. And the one up there at the top, the little orange one, we don't really know. It could be Cambellia, it could be a different thing, could very well be its own new species. Uh, jury is kind of still out on that one. So as far as what our results actually mean, um, we really wanted to figure out like what the composition of our entire fish population was. So we went back and we looked at our fingerprinting from the gels and we were able to take the, um, the phylogenetic data and compare that with our fingerprinting to basically come up with a pie chart for this different strain composition of each of our two new fish species, Cephalia and Rosigaster. What we found is Rosigaster only contains photobacteria, which is what we expect. That's, that's the bacterium we know inhabits it and it has its own three different lineages. You can see they're sort of color coded there. Um, Cephamia cephalides, on the other hand, has a decent chunk of photobacterium and a lot of Vibrio, which is, again, the one that we don't know why that's there at all. It hasn't ever been documented there. Um, and then for context, red, pink, orange all indicate Vibrio, and then all the shades of blue are photobacteria. Um, also, interestingly, our lineages are completely different. The ones that Cephamia cephalides uses do not appear in Rosigaster and vice versa. So again, this is kind of taken to be a really remarkable example of host specificity, where this fish only uses a very, very specific kind of bacteria. What we figured out is it's even more specific than we thought. Um, these fish, which can literally be caught, you know, I don't know, a mile apart from one another in the same like harbor of the same city, somehow are still picking up only the fish or only culturing the fish, the, the bacteria that they want specifically that are not for their other species, which is very strange. Um, it does kind of open the door for potential dozens of discrete species specific lineages. This is now like the second and third species of siphon fish we've looked at in any detail and there are 28. Um, and just these two have like, you know, three distinct lineages that are unique to them each. Um, so there's a lot to be done there um, in terms of figuring out what other strains of this bacterium exist and how that might have potentially co-evolved. Um, we have to be tentative when saying that because there's just so much unknown going on. But there's a bigger question we want to address still, which is why on earth are we seeing Vibrio here? That's like entirely the wrong bacterium. They're like barely even related to photobacterium. They're in the same family, but for bacteria, that's like miles apart. Um, so again, Vibrio can be a number of different things. It can be an environmental contaminant or a pathogen. And we think that's probably the case for one of our Vibrios. 
Um, what I did here is I took the three fish, which contained some amount of Vibrio, and I made a pie chart for strain composition for each fish individually. Not the whole population of, of the species, but just that one fish. And SC16 has seven lineages of photobacterium we collected from it and one of Vibrio. So that's most likely, we think, like just contamination or maybe it was a sick fish that had been infected with Vibrio. However, we really don't think that's the case for SC9 and SC12 because out of the eight samples we collected, all eight of them look like they're Vibrio, which is strange because when we plated these, they glow. The fish were presumably alive and healthy and functional, and yet they don't appear to have any photobacterium in them at all, which up until recently we thought was the only thing that lives in them. Um, so this is really pretty exciting. Um, it could absolutely be a new endosymbiont, which kind of breaks our understanding of this relationship because on one end we do have actually even more specificity than we thought and in another species we have a totally different organism that's serving as a symbiont um also the species that are being used potentially as symbionts in these two vibrio lineages can be pathogenic so what we might be seeing is that we have vibrio that can be um disease causing but also symbiotic for the same organism um, just depending on how it's absorbed or where it's located in the fish. Um, it has some fascinating potential for a new model system. And luckily for, luckily for us, we have a lot more samples of these fish that we are now going to try to sequence uh, as many more strains from their light organs as possible to see if we can find any photobacterium, to see if it's just Vibrio. Really could go either way. We have, we've got some work to do and we're hoping to get started, I think, in the near future. Um, that's most of it, obviously. Lots of acknowledgments, as is tradition for the day. Um, the Gould Lab has been great. I've really enjoyed working here. It's been an incredible opportunity. Um, I'd also like to thank everybody in CCG for keeping the lights on and helping us with a lot of things. Uh, to Joe Rosek for digging me, uh, digging me out of like 15 different holes I ran into with like bioinformatics. I feel like I was in his office every other day. Um, the wonderful people who run this SSI internship. Um, and to Krista Seidel and Rita Mehta, who are two of the people at UC Santa Cruz who got me here. Um, I'm very, very grateful to them. And also, especially, I'd like to thank everybody for the SSI cohort of 2023. Y'all have been awesome. It's been a true pleasure to meet you all and get to know you. Um, I sincerely hope we all stay in touch. And just as a, a token of, of gratitude, I made fish art for everybody. So, <laughs> so don't leave without getting these, please. I spent a good amount of time. Um, <laughs> and um, that's all I got. All right, questions. Uh, my question is about the host specificity. Also, nice job on the presentation, by the way. Thank I just you. want to say it's very well delivered. Um, so my question is, do we know, just like in, in general, sort of with these like bioluminescent fish, if there's any other cases of like multiple symbionts living in a single organism? I'm not sure if like for other species of fish, we know for sure in the Safamia group, it's until this project we thought it was only ever mendifimensis like ever hard line in the sand there i don't know about other species i feel like it's usually fairly specific um the again the issue is that we can only look at like three of the 30 lineages because all the other ones live like two miles down and if you try to bring them back they turn into muck um so i, I think to answer your question it's mostly specific, but we kind of thought this was the extreme end of that spectrum, and it might be an even more extreme end than we thought in both directions. That was really great. Um, I'm a microbiologist, so I love, uh, who cares about fish art? I wanna see microbe art. <laughs> so I, actually, I have two questions, but I don't wanna be greedy. So I'll start with my first. The extreme amount of host specificity uh, suggests there's might be a lot of vertical transmission. Mm -hmm. do, do you know how these bacteria are transmitted between fishes? We believe so. I, I wanna make sure I'm, if I say anything wrong, cut me off, but I believe what we know right now is that these are just bacteria which are present in high amounts in the water um, and that there isn't really like parent to offspring exchange of bacteria. Um, it's just that these fish naturally will take up their bacteria and I believe it's the seventh or eighth day after hatching where they, okay, that's, that's good and I got nodding. 
Um, I believe it's the seventh or eighth day after where they hatch that they can start taking up and then their light organ opens up, accepts some amount of bacteria and then seals again. Um, so it seems like this is just something that they naturally accrue in like the first week of life, um, which is again, really strange because how are they able to differentiate that precisely across strains? Yeah, but this is where biology plays out in the genetics and phylogeny, mm -hmm. this extreme host specificity, but mm -hmm. then the Vibrio coming in. So my second question is, maybe Vibrio is not a good thing. Maybe it's a climate change indicator or an invasive species that's like pushing out uh, photobacterium. That's it's certainly possible. Again, it's like we were, I think, so unprepared for this finding. Like we thought we were going to be looking at like six different kinds of photobacterium. And then we had 11 kinds of photobacterium and like a different genus. So we're still kind of wrapping our heads around what that means. <laughs> um, but there are a lot of, I, certainly that's a plausible, I think, implication. Uh, less of a question and more of a request from the online audience. They do want to see the fish art. Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, these are all going to be very small, but they're like, I don't know if I can hold them up and they'll, they show up at all. Here's one. Yeah, that, that shows up. That's great. It does? Okay. I've got, I've got, yeah. Everybody gets one. Frogfish. I don't know if that's. Oh, they're all different. Woo. Um, yeah, was that, was that satisfactory? We need to do the full 13. <laughs> the full 14. Well, I'm, I'm an aquarium biologist, so who cares about bacteria? I care about the fish. <laughs> Here we go. Mm -hmm. um, I just was wondering, I know the ecology and the, and the behavior of the tropical species that are associated with various species of urchins um, for protection, and at night they change color and they come out and they feed. What about these two temperate ones? I'm not familiar with those. What do you know about their ecology? So, yeah, so that's, um, we know that the genus Safami, which like I said, is 28 species, it's split into two clades. The tubifer clade is like the mostly tropical one, and it's, like you said, the urchin associators. Then the other clade, confusingly, is called tubulata, I don't know why we went with tube and tube for both, but the other one is um, tubulata, which contains the other two tropical or uh, subtropical and temperate species. And I don't believe they do associate with urchins. I think they're um, sometimes associate with like algae or other um, sort of um, bottom flora and fauna, but they don't generally stick with urchins as much. Um, there might be some that go for like crinoids. I'm just not sure. There's, there's a whole diversity of them. I think again, they're. It's the same behavior where they feed at night. Yes, I believe so. Thank you. All right, let's give Dawson a hand. All right. Is this the right presentation? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so next up, we have Joy Falatico, uh, who's joining us from Bryn Mawr College. Uh, and was advised this summer by Dr. Alora Lopez Nandan. Can y'all hear me good? Yeah? Okay. Hi, my name's Joy. Uh, I work with Alora Lopez Nandan and I work uh, with Coral. So this will be your last Coral presentation today. So get sad. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm also an SSI intern. I'm going to be a senior at Bryn Mawr College, and my summer project is analyzing the effects of experimental treatments on growth and survivorship of stony coral recruits. Uh, and I know that today we're talking about stony coral. These are not stony coral. There is not any artwork in here that will be stony coral, but just a quick shout out to other our Nidarian friends. So. So the first slide is just a little background on why coral reefs are important. Uh, coral reefs are among the most diverse and vital ecosystems in the world. Uh, the proportion of live coral cover positively affects species diversity and fish abundance. Um, however, reefs face many threats such as increased disease incidences and bleaching due to warmer waters. Um, and reduced numbers of corals has led to uh, lower success, lower success success of sexual reproduction and can prevent reefs from producing genetically varied uh, corals, uh, which then worsens reef degradation. So a little background on spawning. Um, this is just on how corals spawn. Corals, specifically ours, Acropora, Millipora, re reproduce sexually in an event called mass spawning uh, once a year around three nights in Australia's early summer. 
um, and mass quantities of eggs and sperm are released simultaneously from a huge number of coral colonies. Um, after the gametes release into the water by adult corals, they undergo three general stages, um, which you can see up here. The first stage is fertilization and embryonic development, which is right at the top in the uh, right. Uh, the second stage is larval growth, um, which you can see more towards the left. Uh, and then third is settlement and metamorphosis. Um, and in each of these stages, uh, likelihood of survival is very, very low. Uh, so just a little background about the experiment that was conducted. Um, early mortality of coral recruits, uh, like I mentioned, it remains one of the biggest roadblocks to rebuilding coral populations. Um, with as many as 90% of coral recruits um, that settle dying within the first six months. Um, and these are actually only 1% of larvae that like survive. Um, so very, very low numbers. Um, and making a calcium carbonate skeleton is incredibly energy intensive. Um, and it illustrates an energetic problem that coral face going from larvae to a coral recruit. Um, and by exposing these recruits to experimental rearing conditions, we hope to provide resources uh, that these recruits could use to regain energy lost during this time. Um, and this is actually our coral regeneration lab. And you can see the coral that we grow here in the bottom. Uh, and I actually have a tile that we use. So this will come in handy later, but this is how teeny it is. So just keep it in mind. Uh, and the corals only take up a, a very, very small portion. It would be very hard to show. Um, but just more background about our treatment. Uh, the project focused um, on testing treatments to increase early growth and survivorship of Acropora millipora corals within the first two months um, of life. In December, 2022, uh, we treated coral larvae with three different experimental treatments, including seawater alkalinity, symbiont addition and amino acid addition um, at four days. So you can see here that they spawn um, and that we get them, we separate them into controls and then our treatments, and then we put them all back into a common tank. Um, and so just a little bit about buffers, which is one of our treatments. I analyzed all of the treatments, but we're going to be specifically focusing on buffers for this presentation, because if we focus on all of them, I would be up here all day. And these are the most interesting ones. So congratulations. Um, so uh, buffering specifically is incredibly important uh, because it provides more carbonate into the water that hopefully makes it less difficult for coral to then pull out of the water to make their skeletons. Um, buffering seawater uh, also enhances larval production being used like in other circumstances such as at-risk marine invertebrates like oyster hatcheries, which I thought was really cool. Uh, each of these buckets represents a treatment and the containers within the buckets, I think you can see them, um, they represent replicates uh, within each treatment. So we did the treatments multiple times. Um, and all of the treatments had a control. And the data that came from all of this is the data that I worked with this summer. Um, so yeah, so just going on to research now, Ariana, who is also one of Alora's intern, who is amazing. If you ever meet her, talk to her about her cat. She loves it. Uh, <laughs> we looked at photos of recruits at three different time points from January 5th to February 18th. So for the buffers, we'll be looking at January 6th, uh, January 25th, and February 18th. Um, and altogether, we measured, uh, we measured around 1,084 corals, which is a lot. Um, and that basically it means that we measured, eight, we measured 1,084 times. The amount of corals is three different time points. Uh, for each photo uh, was in a dated file, a treatment file, and a rack file. And to find the tile that you're working on, each individual tile had to be matched back to a master photo of tiles within a set. It's like a really crazy Google like folder that you just have to keep going into until you like cannot return. Uh, <laughs> so here you can see the curls at the three time points. Oh, whoops. Uh, I don't think I can move down on my notes. But but that, oh, that's okay though. Uh, yeah, that's okay. So the red circle is not actually marked what we measured in image J. Um, it just shows them at three different time points. And it's important to say that if the second coral dies, it's still like the first coral and the third coral are still labeled first and third, the three separate time points. That becomes incredibly important as we like go further into this. Uh, and also in image J's, uh, the tiles on each photo were measured based on different shapes and correlating lengths. So this one is measured differently than the other ones. Uh, 
Uh, and then the surface area of each coral on the each tile was measured and number of surviving recruits was noted at each time point to track growth and survivorship across treatment. Uh, the photos and coral were then matched up by individual time point and the photo was added to a Google Slides. Uh, and then each of these corals were numbered, as I said before. Um, all of this information was then also put into Google Sheets uh, along with observer, date, rack number, folder, coral indicated file name, recruit area, recruit mean, recruit minimum and maximum notes and their matching file based on the time point. Um, yeah, so that's that. Uh, and then I myself made a master sheet of all the data, data and labeled um, by set. And then I gave each individual coral an individual coral name that replicated through the three time points. Um, and then this meant that for each coral, I had to go back to each image and make sure that each of the 1,084 corals matched, were all consistent, the labels were all the same. Uh, and this can be especially hard when you have a coral that is measured in one photo on a tile and then is measured in a separate different photo of a different tile during the next round. It can also be hard when your tiles look like this. Um, this is one of the biggest ones. It did happen quite frequently. Um, I believe there's 32 recruits on this and they all have sometimes varying mouths from one to like, I think three. Um, but yeah, it can be really hard when it looks like this, especially because sometimes photos are blurry, sometimes the tile is like shifted slightly, so you have to make sure it still matches up. Uh, and then sometimes the urchins decided that they just wanted to sit right on top of the coral, and so you cannot measure that. But yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah, uh, looking at our results. The first graph we're going to be looking at shows recruit counts, means, and standard deviations. This is time point one. Um, and it, it's after just a few weeks after spawning, uh, we can see that there is more settlers for buffer treatments, uh, which we actually didn't expect. We didn't expect it to affect the recruits so early on. Uh, this held through to the second time point, which is really good. Um, and then time point three, however, takes a dip. And we believe that this is because of urchins. And those of you who know me and have been working with me know that this is literally the bane of my existence. Uh, <laughs> So urchins, uh, around February, we also started to see urchins begin eating the corals due to an urchin barren, and that obviously impacted the number of recruits. Um, going forward, we're, we're going to be using a different species of urchin, and we're also going to remove them once they get big enough so they don't overwhelm the coral babies. But yeah. Uh, another piece of result that we have involves the area of all recruits. Uh, and we can see in this graph a wide range of buffer areas uh, as buffer recruits have many settlers in more clusters or they're just bigger. And we can see that in the upper half of the graph. Um, this is the same data as we looked at before, but it's just means and standard deviations. Uh, there's not a big difference statistically, but it's interesting because the buffers are impacted during the first time point. And we didn't expect that. Um, the means are consistently higher, uh, so that are, the recruits are either bigger or they clustered. Um, and this is super cool because this is what we had hoped to see. Uh, the standard deviations are pretty large, but we're hoping that we uh, measure individual growth. Um, this will change. Uh, I keep saying that. And <laughs> there's a decrease during the second time point. We think that's because the corals weren't looking so good during the second time point. They died before the third time point, and we didn't even factor them in after that. Um, and while it looks like the buffers are doing their jobs, we need to continue doing research and testing to figure that out which is good because we just got a grant to do that. Yay. Oh, uh, so future work. Uh, so the future work would be to calculate growth rates of individuals, uh, which would then shrink standard deviation uh, at each treatment. We have also talked about uh, continuing my work here and doing my senior thesis, uh, which is super cool, and looking at cluster formation and tile type, which would be super cool. Uh, and the goal is to find treatments that are most successful and share them with other collaborators, such as the Rotan Marine Park, um, so that they can use it on their reefs, which are experiencing coral tissue loss. Uh, and then just my thank you in a dollar screen stage. And I just love this frog photo that I took, so I thought I would share it with you guys. <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank my wonderful mentor, Alora Lopez Nandum. She's so fantastic. I'm so grateful for her time and energy, especially with R, because that, yes. I think that was, <laughs> I think that was a part of the notes that got cut off is the fact that I, you, yes, we used our studio to calculate mean standard deviation and survivorship rates and we used formulas and plugged everything in. Um, 
And then my little corner of B2, Amy and Tala for keeping me sane, uh, Luigi, uh, who kept me my head above the mud. Uh, and then I just wanted to thank uh, Ariana Love, Dr. Rebecca Albright, Dr. Lauren Esposito, Dr. Rebecca Johnson, and Dr. Edward Myers for being so fantastic and putting this together. It's been amazing. Uh, the National Science Foundation, because they funded me. Um, and then the rest of the SSI interns are also being so fantastic. And then, yeah. And then, Acrofor. Uh, yeah. And then, are there any questions? All right. Come in, Prakrit. Um, I'm not sure if you mentioned this already, but what was the purpose of the sea urchins in this experiment? Yeah, so we keep them there because they're cleaners, and also it's just to make everything like the natural environment. Yeah, so it's like very similar to how these squirrels would be growing if they were in Australia. I think in the mention. Excuse me. I think in the beginning you mentioned <laughs> um, the mortality rate of the corals. I don't know if that was when you were doing spawning or if that's like a reflection of in the wild. But I don't. I wanted to ask, like, is the mortality rate in the wild like always that high? Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's always that. Well, Got you. Thank you. Oh, okay. I just wanted to uh, say that the urchins, um, that in the past we used a different species, and the reason that we add the urchins is because if you don't, the coral and algae overgrows the coral recruits and smothers them. So the small urchins, they're juveniles that go in, they're about that size of a pinhead, and they'll keep that under control. But the species that we had this time grow much faster, and they got too big, and that's why they started going after your little coral settlers. So next time we'll get it right. Yeah, I was told about that. It's called uh, science. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's give Joy a big hand. Thanks, Joy. All right. <laughs> Next. You can come up here right now. Next up, we have uh, Dylan Hyland, who's joining us from California Polytechnic University Humboldt uh, and was advised by Dr. Edward Myers. Uh, hello. Thank you for having me. Uh, I was working this summer on how phylogenetics and morphometrics refine species limits within soft-scaled vipers. And so we'll start off with what is a soft-scaled viper. So they are members of the Viperidae family, the Viperini subfamily, and the Echis species group. They are venomous, and they're pretty small in size. They grow up to 85 centimeters, but usually they're way smaller than that. And they have a pretty varied diet. Primarily, what research we know about their diet so far is that it's invertebrate-focused, so a lot of locusts, larger insects, arachnids, so scorpions primarily, and worms even. Reptiles and amphibians would make up the next known food species. So lizards, other snakes, toads, frogs. Small mammals and birds have also been reported, though it's still under researched as a diet study. They, like other vipers, have keeled scales. So down here, we see the keels in the center line, like the midline. They have, like other vipers, those scales, but particularly with this genus, you can see up here that the lateral flank scales, so the ones on the left and right side, are downturned by 45 degrees and slightly protrude. And that assists in a defensive stridulation behavior that we should hopefully see in the next slide. Is 
an example of a stridulation behavior. It's their defensive mechanism similar to a rattlesnake's rattle in that it's meant to ward off aggressors or predators of the species. And the sound that you heard is not hissing and it's not the sound of the scales on the stone, but it's the sound of those keeled downward turned scales rubbing against each other, which is why they're constantly moving. That's the next one. This one. Cool. So we have a genus that is pretty in, it's pretty contentious in terms of species and diversity. So we have, the literature currently states that there are probably 12 species. It has started initially as two separate species that has since grown upwards of 13, but most literature cites 12. And those are all found in four separate species complexes. So those are all denoted here. The color bands associated here are going to be seen throughout the rest of the presentation to keep everything in order. But we have the oscillatus complex found in Western Africa, the pyramidum group, the complex found throughout most of North Africa and a little bit into the Arabian Peninsula. We have the coloratus species complex found throughout the Arabian Peninsula and slightly into North Africa. And we have the carinatus group found primarily in Southwestern Asia and a little bit into the Arabian Peninsula. All right. And so to get answer some of the questions that still remain about this genus, we took a two pronged approach. We did phylogenetics and we did morphometrics. So our phylogenetic approach started with samples. So I got samples from the California Academy of Sciences, the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology in Berkeley, as well as the Smithsonian Museum. We extracted them and we amplified through PCR the cytochrome B mitochondrion gene. We sequenced, aligned those uh, sequences and then created a maximum likelihood phylogeny, which we then analyzed using a single locus delimitation technique called MPTP, which is specifically designed for groups of species or taxonomic groups that have sampling distributions that aren't evenly spread across their ranges. So they're not evenly sampled throughout their populations. And what did we find? We found this phylogeny. So we took 134 total sequences. I ran myself 24 here at the CCG, the competitive or Comparative Genomics Lab. And then the rest of them were pulled from GenBank, which holds all previously run and published sequences for the genus. And our MPTP approach suggested 13 separate species, so pushing the boundaries of what is currently recognized for the genus. And this is the range. So we have a couple range maps coming up. This one starts with all the specimens found from GenBank. So you can see our Carinatus group in purples found here in Southwestern Asia. We have the Coloratus group found throughout the middle uh, Arabian Peninsula, the Oscillatus group in Western Africa and the Pyramidum group kind of all over um, the Arabian Peninsula and Africa. And then these are the samples that I ran. So we find the Carinatus group here of note because it's the first time we've had samples actually sequenced from Iran. So it bridges the gap of the Western Asian route into the Arabian Peninsula, or it starts to bridge that gap. And then totally distributed, this is all of our samples throughout their range of the genus. So we mentioned the four separate complexes, and I'll break down that absolutely massive phylogeny down into each of those separate groups. So this is the Carinatus complex. We see its range once more, and hopefully easier to depict where the specimens came from. And currently, uh, the Carinatus complex was recognized as to one species, the Carinatus species. However, our MPTP approach suggests that there is an offshoot group right up here in species three that is separate enough to be considered up for suggestion as its own species, separate from the parent Carinatus group. And we can see that division through this map where we have species three, the new one, potentially new one, rest resting in Eastern uh, India, whereas the rest of species four, the currently recognized Carinatus group, spreading along Western India and into the Arabian Peninsula. The oscillatus complex is kind of complicated. Oh boy. So um, the, what we currently have are four species that are recognized. The Echis jogeri, Echis oscillatus, 
and the Atkes uh, Romani, which is, I don't know why the boxes aren't, right? But the, um, the species seven here are all currently recognized taxonomic units. So, but species six is not yet known. So that is potentially also a new species, though we only have one sample of it, and it's in between the Oscillatus group and the Jogari group. So improving our sampling in that area may help improve that as a special species designation. What we do have with the Coloratus group is a further separation of two Coloratus species. So we have species nine and 10, both called Coloratus, though neither, though the species nine looks to be its own separate distinct lineage through our MPTP approach. And the Omanensis shows further support. It's been a species recognized for quite a while. We continue to further that support here. The Pyramidum group is more complicated. So we have species 12, which upon first glance looks like a brand new species. Another team actually sequenced this ECHS-CF specimen, and that one was found as the only species that has, or the only specimen that's currently being run for that species group. And they suggested it as its own species. And we've further here found three more samples that further support that idea, that hypothesis. So that's really cool to see. The Kutskotsky and the Borkini groups are both currently recognized species, where those are still shown to be supported here. Though what we have down here in species 15 is Echis pyramidum, so the name of the complex, as well as a currently recognized Echis leucogaster species as synonymous with each other. So our MPTP approach says that this group has been split too many times, and it's actually one whole species. So we took that phylogen phylogenetic approach, and now we need to look at kind of the morphometrics that we analyzed. So we took 134 snakes measured from the California Academy of uh, Sciences, their collection, though we excluded juveniles and compromised specimens from our complete data set because we couldn't analyze a snake that had been had its head crushed for skull measurements. Doesn't really work that way. So I took those specimens that were adults and of, ver of you know, quality, that's a weird way to say that, and then determined the sex of those specimens in order to account for dimorphism between males and females, and then took nine total measurements. So I took three body measurements, so snout vent length, tail length, and the widest ventral scale on their body, as well as six cranial measurements. So we had skull length, post-orbital distance, internasal distance, head depth, eye diameter, and then rostral length. And what did we find with those measurements? A PCA plot that doesn't help a whole lot at first, at first glance. So the PCA here shows all of the morphological characteristics measured paired against each other. We did not find any dimorphism with the measurements we've taken. So we could include all both males and females in this graph. And we did not find variation between species at a genus level. So if you were to take the measurements that we took on any random individual sampled, you would not be able to ID it to a species with these measurements. But what we do start to see is a variation at the species complex level. So we can have Oscillatus, which starts to build its groups, potentially separate from Coloratus, which starts to build its group here. And if we further improve our data sampling, we might be able to make those groups more distinct. We also see a blank slideshow that is now back. <laughs> and we can see that even within complexes, we can start to see at least minute details and differences between species 14 right here, making this oblong ellipse, and species 15 making this more circular one over here. So what do we kind of take away from this study so far? Genetic sequences are necessary for accurate species delimitation within this genus, though different methods may reveal different results. We took an MPTP approach, which suggested different delimitation limits of multiple species and breaking them into smaller groups. We also had a recombination or a synonymization of the Pyramidum and Leucogaster species. We also found that morphology is not sufficient enough yet for differentiation at a genus level. 
though it might be valid for species complexes. So what do we do with that moving forward? We took a two-pronged approach to get here. We'll take a two-pronged approach to continue to publish and work on this data. There's a phylogenetic approach where I'd like to compare our analysis made specifically for species groups that are not evenly distributed and try and test that against the more common GMYC method to see if these breaks and re or these synonymizations into limitations differ in terms of different methods and see how we can vary and change or support one method over the other for this genus. I also like to consider multi-locus data so that we can track gene flow or nuclear versus mitochondrial DNA changes so we can get more precise or more zoomed in picture at what's happening with our species and our genus here. Also continue to collect our morphometric data. So increase the amount of samples. We always like more data because it makes the facts that we find more important, more significant. I'd also like to add samples from all the delimited, delimited lineages so the ones that we found, as well as the ones that are currently recognized, we didn't have samples from a couple of the species that exist because they're super small in range and not super common found throughout, as well as the ones that we think might be species at this point. So from that Carinatus group in the west or in the east of India, as well as that Oscillatus group kind of right in the middle. And with that comes time to thank everybody who made this whole research experience possible. Thank you to the NSF for funding me, the Cal Academy for having me, Ed for the never-ending support that, I, that goes like further beyond what I'd ever expected. So thank you, Lauren, for allowing me to pepper her with questions and bug her and spend all my time in her lab. Thank you for that. Thank you for Raina for teaching me kind of how a museum works, because I've never been back here before. Lauren and Rebecca for allowing me to have this opportunity to pursue research. Lynn, Grace, and Dr. Athena for teaching me how the CCG works so I can build good data to support my research. Ayana for helping me figure out how R works. UC Berkeley and the Smithsonian for giving me samples. Dr. Frank Fogarty and Barbara Klukas from Cal Poly Humboldt who were my references and have supported me getting here. My family and friends who made me a scientist in the first place and my fellow SSI interns who kept me sane and smiling throughout this entire insane uh, program. So thank you. <laughs> Questions? Wait, hold up. All right, questions. All right, we have time for a couple questions. Yeah, I'll That was a great talk. Um, so I'm really interested in that group where you had the samples from, you said Iran, Iran that were like the new kind of bridge between potentially, you know, where they came from and where they got to. Is there a hypothesis about that, that transition? Or like to me, I mean, I work in marine systems. So I'm like, oh, there's a little like channel there. They just like hop over. But I know these are snakes. So like, do you think like, it seems to me more likely like a bird or something would have like dropped them over as opposed mm -hmm. to going all the way up and over. And do your data help figure that out at all? Yeah, so that was definitely something that I was interested in as well. So I always thought, you know, maybe it was just a speciation event. So snake got stuck on a log floated across the river, and now we're in the southern part of the range of the Arabian Peninsula. But with these samples into Iran, so there's like a couple books and literature that's published saying that they're here, but we've never had a sequence, like an actual catalog specimen that's come from that region until this study where we pulled some out of our collection and helped build that bridge. So that supports that there was actually a land takeover or that perhaps they had inhabited this range before the sea was all water. And they, maybe that was a transitionary period, but it helps support that the idea that it wasn't just a speciation event across water, but we're not certain either way. Hi, that was awesome. Um, how were species defined in the group in the first place? And then also your tree didn't have any support values. So I was wondering where those clades actually supported. So the second question first, yes, they were supported. Most of them had pretty high confidence intervals. The first part, it was a lot of morphology attempts and range-based methods. So 
a lot of uh, projects and papers have been previously published using like patternization on the head. So this species has a cross on its head sometimes this one has like circles on its lip but sometimes they're just blocks mm -hmm. and so it was consistently refuted between a bunch of different papers we were reading building that so we wanted to try and take a genetic approach to try and build that because if or if or doesn't exactly help mm -hmm. piece together a venomous snake species yeah. from this kind of area but thank you Great talk, Dylan. Um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts about like why there might be overlap of two seemingly like not related species groups at the like southeastern tip of the Arabian Peninsula. I can't remember the name of the green and the purple. Yeah, so the green one. Oh, I guess there's yeah. two in the southern. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not sure why or why they're so separate. They are so in terms of venom structure. With a lot of these species, at least the literature says, that one antivenom doesn't work. So they're completely different species or for like bites from another one, despite their overlapping range. So they're completely different. I don't know how they've filled their niche to be so similar in locality, yet so different genetically. So unsure on that one. Super cool. Thanks. Awesome. Are we all good? I don't want to go in front of the camera. Sorry. Um, all right, let's give Dylan a hand. Thanks, Laura. Thank you. All right, and we, I know those of you just joined us, we are a little bit behind, so we're going to take a break now, and we're going to reconvene at 3.25. So 3.25, see you all back here.
Are we ready? Can y'all take a take a seat? Get comfy? Settle in? We're going to get started. It's louder. It's louder. All right, so everyone find a seat. We're going to get started again. Franklin. <laughs> Uh, all right, so uh, we are, have our final four talks of the entire symposium. The whole summer is coming to an end shortly. Uh, and next up, we have Lily Case from Oregon State University, who was advised by Drs. Adriana Hernandez, Maya Jones, and Dr. Sarah Jacobs, all of whom are at the Botany Conference. So hopefully they're joining us virtually. Uh, come on up. Wonderful. Hi, everybody. Um, that open. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, to reiterate, my name is Lily Case, and this summer I worked in Dr. Sarah Jacobs' lab in the botany department here at the California Academy of Sciences under the mentorship of Dr. Adriana Hernandez. And my project was to quantify the diversity of the coastal California Castilea species complex using geometric morphometric analyses. The species complex that I worked with this summer is located along the coast of California, and that corresponds with the California Floristic Province that you see here, which is an internationally recognized biodiversity hotspot. And what that hotspot means for California is that of the approximately 200 Castilea species distributed all across North America and South America, a third of them are found here. In other words, there's a high species diversity for the genus where we're located. And Castilea is a good study group for this species diversity in part because it's a younger lineage. Its diversity of species is still in the process of unfolding. There's evidence of gene flow across species, which is part of what makes the species in this complex taxonomically challenging, let's say. Um, the images shown at the bottom are each of the five different species that make up my study group. And here they are again, now color-coded with a box and plotted to their known occurrence in the California Floristic Province. But what we see is that these species share overlapping geographic ranges. This is an identification issue since it's common for botanical keys to diagnose species based in part on the individual's geographic location. That alone shouldn't be too much of an issue. There should be other defining traits between species, right? <laughs> At a very basic level, um, one similarity might be that they're all red, but even that isn't necessarily true. The species complex is known to be polymorphic, not only in color, but in shapes of floral organs. And both of these traits are diagnostic in botanical species keys. They're also known to hybridize, producing individuals with intermediate shapes in, a different, in addition to this polymorphism. And all of these problems tie back to the fact that they're a young and diversifying lineage still. There's lots of complications in this species complex. And as you might imagine, existing keys reflect this insanity, so to speak. Botanical keys use all floral organs to diagnose species, like the different ones that are shown here from the flora of North America. In addition to various botanical terms that are used to approximate shape, keys typically and historically depend on linear measurements of traits, which are highlighted in boxes up here. And these are known as linear morphometrics. There's also a different method, geometric morphometrics. This method removes size as a variable and focuses entirely on shape taking readings of many linear measurements to create composite results. And these are the morphometrics that I use in my project this summer. And since the internship only lasted two months, I only focus on one organ, calyces. This is what a singular calyx looks like not dissected. An individual is gonna have multiple uh, calyces as well as all the other floral organs. And this is what a calyx looks like when it is dissected, which is the way that I worked with them. Uh, calyx is the word for the sepals of a, of a flower collectively, and in this case, the sepals are fused. There are three clefts when dissected in this way, and these are the points that we use to stack all of our samples. We selected this organ in particular for my project because as a reproductive structure, calyces are likely under selection, so we would expect to find variation. So 
with all of that in mind, if you were handed all of the calices like this, my guess is that you would have a difficult time trying to group them all together. I know that we did. <laughs> um, there's some very rounded tips. There's some sharp tips. There's some deep clefts. There are no clefts at times. And this is how it is in nature. There's a lot of messy intermediates. My project was essentially looking at all of these with the added benefit of having them identified to species based on existing keys and figuring out how their shapes related to one another. So the aims and hypotheses for this project were the following. Informed by botanical tea, keys, we wanted to examine variation within individuals, within species, and across species. Within individuals, we hypothesized that calices from the same individual would cluster together within species. There will be considerable variation in calyx shape between individuals within a given species. And across species, we believe that there would be overlap in the morphospace of some species while others would remain distinct. In order to do that, we did a lot of sampling, a lot of field sampling. And by we, I mean everybody up here, uh, Sarah, Magdalene, Adriana, Maya, and I guess I did it once, so I'm kind of in that we. <laughs> uh, scans were taken on a, a flatbed scanner in the field of these dissected floral organs to get the image that you see on the right dissected by multiple different organs with the full inflorescence there. Uh, we have quite a number of samples, and since I was only focusing on calices, I'd want to crop out only those, like so. And from there, I manually created intermediate outlines for each image in GIMP. Um, the package that we used in R, Momox, reads my black GIMP outline to produce their own interpretation of the outline. And we then took each of these outlines, stacked them together, and that became the basis of my analysis. We sampled three calices per individual for five individuals for seven species with two presumed species outgroups for a total of 84 calices. The package that we used um, in this project, as I mentioned before, was MOMOX, or Modern Morphometrics. It's a portmanteau. And the first step was placing landmarks on every calyx, which the figure on the far right shows. For our first analysis, we used the bottom of each of the three clefts as landmarks, which are, are circled, because they are clear homologous points for the genus. Homology and homologous points are integral to the comparisons in this particular analysis of geometric morphometrics. The package then selects points to turn into coordinates around the outline, which the leftmost figure shows. Next is the Procrustes alignment, which relies on the landmarks that we created in the first step, and the points in the circles on the right are the circles on the left, uh, or the red dots on the left, and they stack up based on those. The elliptic Fourier analysis pulls from the coordinates to essentially compare the shape of one outlined to the shape of others uh, in a data set, and the elliptical analysis on the right shows an early visualization of what these coordinates are going to become. If you view the graph on the left as an x and y axis, the blue line on the right shows deviation from or distance from the first point, which is circled on the y-axis, and it emphasizes the, the ups and downs in the clefts, again, the blue line. And then we plot all of this newly modified data in the morphospace. Morphospaces share a lot of similarities with principal component analyses, which I know that we have talked a little bit about today. Um, and in each axis shown here, there's a corresponding principal component which in this project are just variations in morphology. Each black point in the morphospace represents an individual calyx, and any given area on the morphospace is visually represented by possible calyx shapes for that particular area. So now that we've got all of the calyces in the morphospace, we can start looking for the answers to our questions. Our first hypothesis was about variation in calyx shape within individuals that they would cluster together. This graph has all calyces color-coded according to the individual that they came from and grouped together by ellipses of 50% confidence intervals. And it shows that some individuals do indeed cluster together, which is, you can look at the red arrow, it has a um, narrow and short ellipse that it's pointing to, but others don't. And I'm trying to, with the black arrow, I'm trying to point out the peachy ellipse that's pretty long and pretty wide, but there's a lot that are pretty long and pretty wide. Um, to answer our other questions about variation across and between species, we went back to the calyces to create average shapes for each species. We're doing it this way to find collective differences in the average in order to test the hypotheses of current taxonomy. So the panel is color-coded by what comprised the averages, and these are the averages that we made for species. The average shapes look pretty similar to one another. There's little difference between like the yellow and the orange uh, and the blue and the green. Sorry, my bad. Between the yellow, red, and green. There's little difference between those. But some of them do look pretty similar to one another. For example, the orange and the pink look distinct. Let me backtrack. A lot of these look super similar, which is why I'm, I'm getting tripped up. But the ones that look really different from each other, pink and orange. Um, and we can see these differences when we plot them against each other with heat maps. 
So the top figure simply shows the two average outlines overlapped, and the bottom is the same thing, but with a heat map that detects variation in shape between the two. The red is more variation, blue is less variation, and the most points of variation are visible at the bottom and the top, so the very bottom of the calyx and the top lobes. Um, and this lobe width variation is supported by our first principal component. The first and second principal component were on the morphospaces earlier, which is up in the right corner for reference. And the positive negative numbers that we see represent standard deviations and the calyces plotted underneath are proxies or representative shapes that visually explain the variation of PC1. So we put the two species averages on either side to show that they fall more or less on either side of the first principal component. As you go left to right, it shows this variation in lobe width, lobe symmetry, which is pointed out by the arrows, and the depth of the adaxial sinus. PC1 explained 40.3% of the variation in this data set, and PC2 explained 23.9% of the variation. So we have the same thing, standard deviations, color-coded average outlines that approximately fall on either side, this time for PC2, uh, which we've identified as the depth in lateral sinuses, the shape of the low tips, which are pointed out by the arrows, and this pinching or decrease in the width at the base of the calyx. Returning once more to the morphospace, now with a better understanding of PC axis 1 and 2, we can start to see our answers for the next two questions. The calyces in this diagram are color-coded according but to species as we know them, and the ellipses, even at 50% confidence, are pretty long and wide in one axis or another. Um, each species has a broad range in the morphospace, which shows considerable variation within a species. So we've looked at distinct data, data clusters so far, but what we see a lot more of is this overlap. Uh, the bulk of the data points are at this dense cluster at the center of the morphospace, which I've identified with my own ellipses. It doesn't represent any confidence. For I'm just trying to show you guys. Uh, there's a lot of overlapping ellipses. There's no obvious clustering that might differentiate between these species easily. That being said, in order to actually identify some differences between the species that overlap and cluster, we returned once more to the heat maps. Uh, we picked a couple areas on the morphospace where there's overlap, and we mapped the average outlines. The two middle species, um, the two species on the far left, excuse me, uh, show the most variation in lobe width, which corresponds with PC1. Middle image between two different species picks up on this, this pinching at the bottom and the relative lateral sinus depths, which is PC2. And far right, the heat map is informed by both of those factors, the widths of the lobes and a bit of pinching at the bottom, which is to say PC1 and PC2. It's not just one axis of variation. So we made all of these figures, and that is just one way of outmarking uh, landmarking the outlines. We also did this two other, method, um, two other methods of landmarking homologous points, and we did the same analyses with the same data set. We also did this to see if we end up with similar results to reinforce our interpretation of the data. And the first analysis with three landmarks and the corresponding morphospace is at the top. We have the bottom left, which is four landmarks, the clefts, and once again, and the bottom left corner of the calyx, and the bottom right is five landmarks, doing instead the lobe tips and this bottom left corner of the calyx. And what we see here is that there's pretty similar results in the PCs as well as the stated distribu distribution maybe mirrored or flipped slightly, and similar results in the heat maps. For this example, we have two overlapping species that are being compared, a heat map from an earlier slide which picked up on the original PC2, pinching at the bottom, lateral sinus depth. But when we landmark the bottom in the middle and right figures, we see the largest area of variation shifting up to the width across the top and center of the calyx, which corresponds with their respective PCs of the different morphospaces. So, so long as you landmark a point on the bottom of the calyx, different landmark methods yield similar heat map results. What might we take away from all of that other than, wow, this species complex is pretty, pretty messy and there was a lot of math that went into this. Um, these results, mainly the depth of lateral sinus clefts and the pinching at the bottom, uh, relative to the width of the top and the ratio that's involved in that will be used in future projects to define which linear measurements we will be taking for species identification. Landmarking at the calyx base was most effective in a full calyx analysis, and the broad conclusion is that calyces and this species complex aren't very different from each other. That these analyses found. Uh, the program has its limitations in detecting certain aspects of variation, notably finer differences, which leads us to the future for this project and the species complex uh, in this lab. The Castellaic project is, is massive in this lab, and we're planning on quartering the calyx outlines, like the images that you see here, in order to detect finer variation in the shapes of the load tips and not just the entire calyx. 
As I mentioned, we'll be exploring linear measurements that are informed by the results of this project. And we will do this whole analysis again, but with other floral organs like leaves and bracts and corollas. And this morphological data isn't just going to exist on its own. It will exist in a larger project with eco ecological and genomic data on the species complex for a more and uh, fuller understanding of the complex. Cool. I'd like to say a big thank you to everybody on this slide and beyond, uh, Adriana, Maya, Sarah, Ricardo, people who, who helped me in my morphometrics journey and just my science journey, uh, Rebecca, Lauren, Ed, people who organized this program, and ev everybody, there was so much, I have so many people to thank. It's like I'm winning an award or something, but I'm not. Um, the cohort and the organizations that made this possible. And um, there's my social media, my email for, for in-depth discussion and my iNaturals, so yeah. I also have somebody else to thank, his name is Clark. So, thank you. All right, do we have any questions for Lily? Lauren has a question. I'm curious, like, do you think that it matters how the calyx was put onto the scanner? Like, since it's a three-dimensional object and then it's the scan is in two dimensions, like, could that influence the results? Yes. So that is definitely something that was taken pretty heavily into consideration. So we, obviously, it's field stuff, so it's difficult at times to keep it consistent. But as we're consistent as we possibly could be, so dissecting along the same side every time and trying to keep these as flat in the flatbed scanner as we could. So it's not like we pulled this diagnostic of dissecting the, the calyx out of nowhere, like this was in flora before we started doing it. Um, it, it has been a challenge just making sure that everything is flat. So all of the, the calyces that we analyzed were actually, we're, we've, we've got it down so that we're able to take pretty good pictures of it, but there's definitely some where they're so folded or mangled up that they're kind of unusable, but not as much maybe difficulty as you would expect. Very nice talk. I have a quick question. Backing up, do you have, did you or do you have any hypotheses for what the variation in calyces was for? possibly um, before going into this or after you found a few things that differed? Do you mean like what adaptive advantage they might propose or? Sure, your ecological function or anything else. So a lot of, just for context, a lot of us were writing abstracts that we submitted to a conference. Um, and in writing that, I was pretty concerned heavily on thinking about this ecological context, uh, which is kind of separate from what the project itself was, was, was pretty morphometrics focused. Um, but we believe that there's like, advantage in the sense that it might modify how pollinators interact with the flower itself, depending on the shape of the calyx. Um, some have like these deeper clefts that make it easier or more um, inhibitive for a pollinator to get inside. So there's definitely a reason for this happening. We think that there's these, these pressures that would select for or against like one shape or another. Not sure if I answered that all the way, but. Um, I was wondering if uh, you, anybody has looked into um, ecological differences between the different species of Castilea that you are working on. Um, from what I understand, some or many of the species in this genus are parasitic on other plants. And I was wondering if they were parasitizing different species, if this group does that. Yeah. Um, so for those, I didn't have a lot of time to talk about it. Um, the ecological context of it. Castilea are a hem hemiparasitic uh, genus. Actually, the whole family consists of parasitic plants. But they're known to parasitize on other plants and other members of the same genus and species as well. In terms of ecological data, I didn't work with any of it this summer, but I know that that's a really big thing that they're planning on working with in this lab. They're going to do some um, field work as well as doing the, those kinds of experiments in the in like greenhouses to see what is parasitizing, parasitizing what, and preferences in terms of that. So that will be taken into consideration, but I think it's a little ways off from, from being done. All right, thank you so much, Lee. Let's give Lily a hand.
All right. Uh, next up, we have San Francisco's own Crystal Grissom, uh, who's, who's currently attending Cornell University <laughs> uh, and was advised this summer by Dr. Brian Simonson. Um, hello, and uh, thank you for allowing me to work on this project this summer. Um, and thank you to Brian, Jim, and Joe for helping me as well. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about the wood rat, rat, and you probably may not have heard of it, but it is a rodent prevalent all throughout um, North and Central America, and they kind of remind me of a cross between a common mouse and a chinchilla. So, and uh, they get their name of, for the massive dens they built out of wood. So they are part of the genus Neotoma, and in this genus there are 23 species of wood rat, and there are even more subspecies within each species of wood rat. So today I'm going to be focusing on the dusky footed wood rat in California, uh, AKA the Neotoma fusipes. And we are, my research project involves specifically looking at the hybrids within the species. So why are we doing all this? Um, we are looking for correlations between uh, copy number variations uh, in between, between, uh, no, in the CYP450 detoxification genes and how this affects their diet. So this means that the number of copies of a specific repeated sequence in DNA can vary between subspecies. So, and this gene allows mice to digest toxic plants. So the more repeats each species has, or each individual has, the more tolerance they would have to a toxic plant. And we're seeing what role these CNVs play in animal response to climate change. So before I get into that part, um, I'm going to delve in their historical background and the previous work that has been done on them. So um, who, both researchers, Hooper and Goldman, did some previous morphological work on them. So in 1910, Goldman identified six original subspecies uh, of this species of wood rat. And Hooper then went on to identify 11 subspecies, which he split into three distinct groups or clades, which he called A, clades A, B, and C, based on a cranial structure in 1938. And he observed that there was lots of intergradation between clades, which means that there were, were a lot of hybrids. Um, okay, so um, the PI of this project, Matok, um, sought to answer the following questions about these mice with her uh, more recent data in 2002. So she asked, are there distinct mitochondrial lineages within Enfusipes? Um, how are mitochondrial lineages geographically distributed? Are regional levels of genetic diversity similar across the entire distribution? And what is the degree of concordance between any mitochondrial subdivisions and the three intraspecific morphological groups identified by Hooper. So she used three types of data to help address her questions. So she collected additional morphological traits other than the ones that Hooper and Goldman observed. And she also used mitochondrial DNA, which Hooper and Goldman did not use, specifically control region and cytochrome B DNA. And cytochrome B is a protein in the mitochondria. And she also used micro, I mean, she also utilized nuclear microsatellites, which are basically repeats in the DNA, like I mentioned before. Um, so to, the answer to this first question is, along with uh, Goldman, Hooper, and Matok's data, uh, the current taxonomy recognizes 11 distinct subspecies distributed among two major clades, which are called clades one and two, and Matok actually was able to describe four subclades within these two clades. Um, they are called the Northern, West Central, Southern, and East Central clades. And she found that with her data, the deepest lineage split occurred between the North and South, south populations around two million years ago. And then uh, subsequently, the Northern populations and Southern populations both split. So. The northern population had a split around 1.8 million years ago to produce the northern and west central clades that I mentioned, and then the southern population split uh, around 700,000 years ago to produce the east central and southern clades. Uh, so here are a few visuals to uh, represent what I just talked about. So uh, 
on the left is a phylogenetic tree that uh, shows the splitting of this species uh, from a common ancestor into the four distinct clades that are described today. And the top two clades are in clade one and the bottom two clades are part of clade two. And then on the right is a map showing their distribution throughout California and Oregon. Um, okay, so how are they distributed? Um, so like I said, the northern population is, so each uh, clade is shown on this map and the entire species stretches from the south of the Columbia River uh, through Oregon and Northern California down to Baja, California. And actually Matoke found that with her results, the Northern population had become so different from the Southern population that she decided to declare the Southern population as its own species, uh, which she called N. Macrotus, as you see on this map and it's also known as the big-eared wood rat. So this is now made up of the southern and east central clades that we have today. And yes, this is what her data showed. Um, so you might be wondering why this species is so varied. Well, this is partly due to a time period called the late Pliocene to early mid Pleistocene time period. So uh, during this time period, there were cold periods that prevented suitable northern habitats from forming. And in addition to this, there were a lot of glaciers that separated the mice populations uh, over time. And so that isolated populations. But then once this cold period was over and the glaciers melted, these new populations that were isolated from the original populations were able to uh, migrate north. And this was also followed by a, an east to west migration, which um, increased the diversity within this species. So. Uh, yeah, in short, the diversity we observe is uh, caused by divergence by isolation or mutations when they migrate to different parts of California. Um, so the answer to this question is that the northern clade actually shows less genetic diversity than the southern clade. And these numbers show here that uh, the south and east central clades contain more uh, genetic diversity within their individuals than the north and west central, cl central clades. And this is also supported by the negative Tajima's D score because uh, this indicates that there is a low frequency of mutations in a population. And in other words, these small populations that are randomly isolated from the original population by glaciers often contain and an equal distribution of traits from what the original population contained and are not representative of the trait frequencies in the starting population. So then they can carry this new distribution of mutations northward or wherever they migrate to. So uh, this is also, this is called the bottleneck effect as shown by this image here. So uh, as you can see, um, the large mar amount of marbles in the bottle represents the starting population and uh, only a few individuals can pass through this bottleneck. So let's say that only blue individuals were allowed to uh, pass through the bottleneck. Then as this population grows, uh, it would only have blue traits and it would no longer have the white and yellow traits. So it could uh, eventually be categorized as its new species over time. Um, okay, so there was shown to be a high degree of concordance between the clades that Hooper described and the clades that Matoke described. So clade A mapped to the northern clade and B mapped to west central. And it was found that clade C actually contains two distinct clades. So the south and east central clade, as I mentioned. And then there are a few exceptions, like in the Sierra Nevada, um, Hooper identified a break between the clades A and C in the northern Sierra Nevadas, but he wasn't sure where it was, whereas analyzing the morphological data now, it indicates a shift in traits in the mid Sierras, and it's also supported by Matoke's mitochondrial DNA. And then there are also, the subspecies aren't exact, so clade B is concordant with the entire west central clade, but it also includes a subspecies that is now considered the east central clade. So, And of course, uh, there was a new species described called N. macrotus, which Hooper failed to identify with his data. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about hybrids. So uh, when testing inland versus coastal groups, so the groups on the west versus the east, a few individuals expressed traits of 
both inland and coastal species. So uh, this was supported by in their intermediate discriminant scores where uh, non-hybrid species would have scores on one end or the other. And then uh, it shows that subspecies had been interacting with one another. Okay, so from this data, there are potential sources of misinterpretation. So uh, one of them is largely due to a phenomenon called incomplete lineage sorting. So this can make it seem like two species are more related than that species is to another when that is not the case. So as you can see on the diagram on the, on the right, it shows that, oh no, on the left, it shows that uh, the original population split and one part of the population only got the blue trait, whereas the other part of the population got both the red and the blue. And then at the B and C split, B split, and they uh, retained the blue trait, whereas C only kept the red trait. But if you look at the incorrect tree on the right, it would appear that A and B are more related to each other because they share more similarities, whereas that is not the case because B split more recently from C than it did from A. So... And then another potential source of misinterpretation were in insufficient samples in some regions. Okay, so how are we contributing to this current knowledge? So we are working with the whole, whole genome data sets to help us further explore, explore these questions. So we are using reference genomes and we are mapping low coverage genomes to the reference genome. Uh, and we are using a technique called variant calling and we are specifically studying hybrid zones and the amount of tandem repeats in the DNA of these hybrids. Um, so here is a pro here's the process of variant calling in detail. So uh, first, uh, DNA sequences identify nucleotides of genomes. So we obtain the DNA sequences. And then uh, quality control to verify the quality of data is done. And then after that, the low coverage genomes for multiple individuals are mapped to the reference genome, which is uh, one singular, singular uh, complete genome that acts as kind of like a control. And then we check the mapping quality and if all of the nucleotides are aligned with each other. And then after all of this, the uh, uh, variant calling pipeline is run and it produces a human readable file. Uh, so you don't need to understand all of this, but this is just uh, the process split into three uh, stages. So the first stage is the quality and control stage, and then the middle stage is the actual pipeline, and then the third is the analysis. And this all takes place on a computer. <laughs> um, oh, how this? Oh, I replaced the image. Okay, so um, so you might be wondering what all of this shows. So this identifies DNA variants between individuals when mapped to a reference genome. So as you can see on the right, um, the variations between DNA could be single nucleotide variants or there can be insertions or deletions. So uh, on the top example, there was a substitution of a single nucleotide, but all the other nucleotides match up with the reference reference genome. And then on the bottom, there was a deletion of two nucleotides, but the rest of the DNA lines up. And this kind of data permits scientists to investigate many questions related to population genetics. So it allows us to see how uh, specific populations have changed with isolation and migration and also hybridization. And through this technique, you can also uh, observe the amount of repeats in the DNA and study more about them. Um, so what I got out of this, I definitely learned way more about programming and scripting, and it's very important in DNA analysis. Uh, technology is very important in that, and I also learned how to use ChatGPT because it is very helpful in telling you how to do things, and I also learned basic genomics, and I learned about how to use tools associated with evolutionary change, like the GATK pipeline, uh, thanks to the SMP calling workshop I did with Alora. So, yeah, and yeah, thank you to you know, um, everybody, and uh, yeah, thank you to the team and the SSI co-directors, Lauren Esposito and Rebecca Johnson, and all the SSI presenters and workshop organizers and leaders, and also everyone in the academy. So, yeah. <laughs>
Thanks, Crystal. Um, all right, other name. Ooh, ready, Sophia. Um, my question is: Are you expecting to find a higher number of repeats of the gene that gives like toxicity resistance in the hybrids? Um, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure, but I would expect that to be the case because it is more favorable and more harsh environments but I guess it would depend where you find the hybrid so okay thank you all right anyone else oh, Luigi so it sounds like you did a lot of um, computer stuff and you almost got carpal tunnel what was um, your highlight of your, yeah, just your highlight? Oh, well, yeah, my highlight was definitely the computer stuff because uh, I like uh, doing stuff in the terminal because it makes me feel smart, you know, like a hacker in a movie or, or something. But yeah, my favorite part was just uh, coding in different languages and I learned a new language, so that was cool. Um, I don't know the evolutionary rate of these variable repeat regions, but how do you reconcile uh, variant calling at the sequence level, like single nucleotide changes with uh, repeat number changes? Is there a bioinformatic technique to resolve those signals? Um, I am not sure, but I think it would just indicate whether a change was a single nucleotide or it took place over a ton of repeats. I'm pretty sure that technology would show distinguish between those two changes, so. All right, thank you so much, Crystal. All right, now for the arachnology talks. I know you've all been waiting. Uh, all right, next up we have Ari Mortensen, uh, who joins us from the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs with us, uh, and it was advised this summer by Jacob Cornell. Hi, everyone. Feel like I'm out of swim meet, but that's fine. Um, so thank you all for coming out, uh, giving us your time today. Um, my name is Ari Mortensen, and I'm going to be I'm going to be presenting my information on arachnids that have been recovered from salmonid gut contents. So salmonids, the the state of California has three primary Sorry, nerves. Um, salmonids. The state of California has three primary species of salmon. The Chinook salmon, which is Oncorhynchus chawicha. The coho salmon, the Oncorhynchus kisuch, and the steelhead salmon, Oncorhynchus micus. Um, all three of these salmons like to live in cold water and live and have a lifestyle where their youth is spent in freshwater streams, after which they go to the ocean as adults and then come back to freshwater for spawning. Um, salmon in this region, they have very important cultural significance for many Native American tribes, such as the Yurok tribe, the, um, the Hoopa tribe, and the Karuk tribe all of which rely on the yearly return of salmon to the Klamath River Basin. Um, additionally, many, many fishers live in, on the California coast, such that salmon has become a very important commercial food product. However, there, salmon, salmon populations in the state of California are being threatened. <clears throat> being threatened um, 
climate change has led to warming water and with the warming water, salmon are less likely to return and successfully spawn. Um, additionally, with increasing temperatures, drought has been a bigger and bigger issue, which in turn makes it hard for agriculture to get by. Um, and as such, many agricultural the agricultural industry tends to divert river water for their farms, which causes the issue of lowering river levels and causing any laid eggs that have been laid within the gravelly shores of freshwater streams to die because they dry out. Additionally, the, their, the state of California has many dams in order to produce energy as such, but these dams have an issue where they prevent freshwater fish from returning back to their spawning place. Um, in recent years, many Native American tribes have been petitioning successfully to get the removal of dams, but this is only one method in which um, the, in which these populations of salmon can be, I guess, healthy. Um, so, let me go back, <laughs> sorry. Um, oh God, I can't do this, um, sorry. This, the removal of such dams is one way in which the population of salmon can be returned back to their healthy conditions, but more action needs to be taken to allow for a healthy environment to be maintained. Um, one of these ways is by monitoring food sources that contribute to overall the healthy state of salmon. Um, salmon engage in, they typically engage in a feeding, a preferential form of feeding called drift foraging, where they find a place within a river where a lot of debris seems to gather. And in that debris that can contain many different food sources, such as terrestrial invertebrates, aquatic invertebrates, other fish. Um, they, they prefer following a following a protocol, I should say, where they want the biggest return for the least amount of effort, um, such that larger and slower prey is more valuable and less taxing energy-wise. Um, and yeah, so benthic and free water prey, they tend to, um, benthic and free water prey, they tend to be more adapted to aquatic predators, salmon, um, whereas terrestrial invertebrates, they're more unsuited to surviving in water. In fact, a research paper in 1999 by Nagano et al. has found that upwards of 77% of all biomass added to streams and consumed by salmon is actually terrestrial invertebrates, which tend to end up in bodies of water via wind or water runoff. As it stands with Terrestrial invertebrates, arachnids are actually an area of study that have arachnids role within aquatic ecosystem, ecosystems has very little literature research. Um, in conjunction with that, so the guilds of such arachnids are also not very well known. Additionally, arachnids have been have shown to be very good sentinel species wherein they wherein they are good indicators of the concentration of toxins in the environment because they can take on high concentrations without showing too many deleterious effects um, this this graph right here from chumchal et al in 2021 shows that in green are a family called tectrognathid, which are typically found on in riparian environments, which are generally wetlands surrounding a body of water. Um, and as you can see, they have 
a high concentration of mercury, whereas all these other ones, which tend to be more foliage or arboreal or terrestrial, show less, which can have implications in the salmon feeding cycle as if arachnids are consumed frequently, they, if, if, if salmon consume arachnids that show to be sentinel sequences, it can be understood how these organisms affect the overall health of salmon. So aims of our research, we want, it was threefold. We wanted to figure out, do arachnids contribute to the, to the aquatic environment as a significant food source to salmon? And tied with this, are there co correlations between salmon size and consuming arachnids? Finally, we wanted to figure out how diverse are the arachnids and their gills when, when taken into consideration an, an aquatic environment and what that might mean in regards to being consumed by salmon. So our samples, we, we worked with 147 different salmon from, a, from all across Marin County streams. They were pulled in 2019, just, yeah, 2019. And most of them were in the PAR stage, it would seem. As you can see, this is a salmon and the gut contents have been removed. These are the gut contents. And from those gut contents, um, we pulled spiders and mite samples. Um, with those spiders and mite samples, we did two, the two things. For the spiders, we use morphological identification using a, using a dichotomous key. And for both the mites and the spiders, we sequenced their CO1 gene to figure out what guilds they may be in. So for morphological identification, the, we had 21 spiders from the 22 different salmon that contained the arachnid samples. And these spiders were identified using this dichotomous key, spiders in North America. Using this key, we were able to key out to a family and possibly a genera where they stood. Here I have um, arrows pointing to many of the distinguishing traits of spiders that I often use to determine what they were. Here I have the eyes highlighted. Their legs were also very important. Um, they also, their spinnerets were examined. When it comes to males, this is a very good sample considering it came from salmon guts. Um, right here is the clypeus, which is the distance between the eyes and the chelicera, which are its fang devices that are used for chewing. Um, so the clypeus was important for identification, the claws were important, and then in males specifically, the pedipalps, which are their sexual reproduction organs, were also a big indicator of species. This right here is something called a patellar apophysis, which is very specific to this species of linophid called Erigene elatris. For morphological identification on the mites, we didn't. Um, they, they were very, very small, and um, we didn't exactly have an adequate key to be able to examine these things. Um, instead, we relied almost exclusive, exclusively, and not, not almost, exclusively on genetic data. Here's one of Here's one of my results for one of my mites, and I'm surprised they turned out so well. So in sequencing the CO1 gene, we did two, one of two things. So for spiders, it's possible to pull legs. Um, if, you pull it, if you pull legs, you want to make sure that some legs remain behind because they're such an important identification mechanism. If, you don't have enough legs, you do a full body soak. And 
for some of the specimens, that's what we did for the spiders and for all the mites that would, we did that for all 12 mites. Um, so surprisingly, we, it was 100% successful for PCR products um, that we were able to get a product back and when it went to go sequence, be sequenced, it was an accurate arachnid ID. No, no samples were contaminated with other arachnids or salmon, which is surprising. Um, there were two hiccups, two mite samples with extremely low concentrations. Typically you want a concentration from what I've gathered from the other interns, you want a concentration of 25 nanometer, nanograms per microliter. And these two concentrations were 0.1-ish. So not exactly the best. Um, and once, once we were able to get the information back on the CO1 sequencing, we were able to use that in conjunction with our mor morphological analysis to figure out where to place these. We did two, gen two different types of categories. So for a more general run one for spiders and mites, we wanted to figure out where generally they could be located. So spiders were determined between being riparian and non-riparian. So either located or typically live in wetlands or around, around water or in areas further away, such as terrestrial foliage, arboreal. Mites were given a category of aquatic versus terrestrial and left as is. So for spiders, we then identified them to a more relevant guild. Um, these guilds were written and described in Cardoso et al's 2011 paper and in order, sensing web, uh, sheet web, space, orb, specialists, ground hunters, other hunters, ambush hunters, and they're, they are tied in order to each of these. These are examples, not my actual specimens. They're too, they're too pretty to be my specimens. So we found that of our 147 salmon, 93% of them were young of the year. So they were less than a year old. And of the 147 salmon, only 15% contained arachnids, meaning Arachnids didn't make up very much, weren't, weren't all that important in feeding for these organisms. We also found that there was no correlation between the salmonid size and arachnids consumed. We, found, we um, examined the fork length where we measure between the tip of the nose of the fish, I guess you could call it a nose, and right where the tail would fork. And comparing that against the presence of an arachnid, these all up here are statistical outliers. So the majority of the data are in these. This one was, we compared the fish weight to the presence of arachnid and also found that the mass of a fish does not impact their will willingness to consume an arachnid. For IDing these specimens, we found there to be five families, 10 general, and 11 definitive species. It was kind of iffy on the species end because even the CO1, um, even the CO1 identification can turn up a bit inconclusive. Um, the, the families include anaph anaphids, tetragnathids, and anapides, or anapids, sorry, clubionids and linifeids. For the mites, we narrowed them down to five families, five genera, and three definitive species. They, these guys were much harder to ID because turns out not many stu people studied them. Um, most of them had have not been defined, but we could get them at least down to a family. Uh, we have, we ended up having hygrobatids, uh, spericontids, erythrids, teranticolids, and parasitids. 
par parasitidase. Um, placing the spiders into more specific guilds, we found that we had six specimens that were orb weavers. We had five specimens that were sheet web weavers, and we had 10 specimens that were other hunters, meaning they were either stalkers or foliage runners. Uh, we found that there was a pretty skewed spread towards the specimens not being uh, riparian species, but it's, we need more data to really come up with a solid conclusion. As for mites, we found that we had five aquatic mites and five terrestrial mites. Uh, here are two examples of the survivors. Um, most of them got destroyed by the, or are very difficult to observe anything on now that I have essentially decimated them by extracting DNA. <laughs> As for limits for this whole process, we, it's, you can imagine it's pretty hard to, I guess, you can imagine it's pretty hard to identify a spider that has been taken from the stomach of a fish, at which point they can be this degraded. You can maybe identify them bit as far as the claws and the eyes, but those aren't the only determining factors. And we, for this specimen, a microlinophia donna, um, we couldn't get farther than sexing it. This is a adult and evidently a much, much more alive specimen. Um, we also found that the age and size of specimens made it quite difficult to properly key them. For example, we had probably two mature male spiders and the rest, and the rest of the males were immature. And then we didn't have a single mature female spider. And when you get to a general identification, you generally rely on the genitalia of the spider, at which point this one, the epigenum, which is part of the genitalia, is not developed at all, versus this is a mature tenu tenuifantis tenuous, which has the proper identifiable sclerotized epigenum. It also, mor morphological identification also relies on having accurate keys. The key I used had some species to a genera, but a lot of others, it didn't. For regarding sequencing, the, as I discussed before, you either do a full body sort or leg pulling, um, which makes things with which can make further identification morphologically difficult and it can ruin a specimen at some times. Additionally, we also found that blast results can sometimes turn up inconclusive, such as this, this Clubiona. It was either a Pacifica or Canadensis, but these percentages of ID make it kind of tough to choose. In conclusion, we found that arachnids constitute a large portion of, or do not constitute a large portion of salmonid consumed prey, and that size of the salmon itself does not determine their likelihood of consuming arachnids. Additionally, we found that consumed arachnids were both riparian and non riparian, and many of them that ended up being non-riparian seemed to be sort of jacks, jacks of all trade, like the Erigene elatris, which is originally a European species, but has made it all the way to California. So they're pretty resilient in some regards and are able to adapt to the environment. Future areas of study, I believe this research can I believe this research will need a larger sample size in order to in order to make more conclusive in order to reach more definitive conclusions. We found that the majority of the fish were young, so their likelihood of eating a spider could be biased toward could 
be biased towards their willingness to eat a spider might be because of their age or possibly due to their small size, they might contain fewer, sp fewer arachnids than a larger fish just by the concept of eating more prey results in more prey bycatch. Um, we also, I also believe that we could take this research further by examining how species might affect the consumption of arachnids, whether a coho eats more arachnids than a, than a Chinook. And ultimately, I think that this research can, will help us with using spiders as sentinel species to monitor the toxicity concentrations in the environment such that we can such that we can maintain the survival of salmon and its continued return to the area. Um, with that, I conclude my presentation. I'd like to thank a lot of people I've met, um, Lauren and Rebecca. I'd like to thank my mentors, official and not, for helping me agonize over tiny spiders that make your eyes cross it sometimes. Um, I'd like to thank the National Park for sending us our salmon samples and the Arachnid Lab overall for harboring me. Um, I'd like to thank the CCG Lab and their patients in trying to figure out how it all runs down there and all of the SSI interns. You guys are fantastic. Um, and I'd like to thank the National Science Foundation for allowing this opportunity to happen in the first place. All right, do you have some questions for Ari? Yeah. Okay, first of all, I want to give Ari a shout out for designing our uh, SSI logo yeah. that everyone's been putting on their PowerPoints. Okay, so my question is, uh, just out of curiosity, I wanted to see if you had like a estimate for like the, uh, I guess like this, the number of spiders that you analyzed morphologically and to see like how many of them were like good specimens and not like too far like digested. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, it largely depends because in some regards, other parts of the spider were completely intact. So you could have a spider with amazing legs and an amazing, um, an amazing carapace and intact eyes and a completely destroyed abdomen, or you could have the reverse. Um, I could probably say the main issue stemmed from the age of a lot of the specimens. The, as, as I, said before, there were a lot of immature ones, so it made even IDing to the family level difficult. Cool, that makes a lot of sense, thank you. That was super cool. Um, I, I, I study fish and I had no idea that they ate spiders, so like mind blown, that's really awesome. Um, so you said that they're not making up a big part of their diet. Did you look at what else was there? Like, like when you were pulling these out, was it like one spider per individual or like how many were you getting from a specimen? I mean, I'm sure it varied a lot. And then did you see some individuals that were like really good at spiders and they would like have a whole gut full of them and then like other individuals like would have none? So 125 didn't have any spiders. Um, and the ones that did have arachnids in general, we had a couple of fish that had like two or three in them. So while we had 33-ish samples, we had only 22 fish total that actually ate arachnids. I noticed, um, uh, thank you for the talk, it was really great. And I noticed at the bottom of one of your slides, you mentioned that sometimes salmon might jump out of the stream. And I'm, I was 
hoping or or thinking you might show that some of those uh, web weavers that might span streams. Do you think that's a, a I mean, obviously you didn't get a lot of spiders, but I wonder if there were, there's a possible risk for predation for certain spiders that might uh, string their webs across streams, salmon streams. There, I, w I wouldn't doubt there to be. Um, it's kind of hard to tell from gut contents, but a lot of our species that we did identify were a, a tetragnathid called Madalena curtisi. Um, and they are typically found in like reeds surrounding, um, surrounding bodies of water. And considering salmon have a tendency to jump to get upstream to get, get back to their spawning places, I wouldn't doubt that they'd be able to jump out and capture prey. Awesome, thanks so much, Ari. All right. For our final presentation of the symposium, uh, we have Sophia Del Val Modersad, uh, who is joining us from University of California, Berkeley, starting in three weeks or something, uh, and was advised this summer by Dr. Franklin Calare Kelme and Jacob Cornell. Uh, and Hi everyone, thank you for staying until the end and for being here. Um, my name is Sophia and this summer I've been working with the Arachnology Lab and I'm excited to share my project with you, Temporal Diversification and Evolutionary History of the Crabellum in Marinoid Spiders. To begin our journey, I wanna share with you a family of the Arrhenii, the spiders. This particular tree comes from the first complete phylogenetic study of spiders published in 2018 by Wheeler et al which is important to our lab because it was the first to suggest a cladal relationship between the marinoid families, the group that we'll be talking about today. Uh, this group has since been confirmed with extensive genetic work in Gorno et al. 2023. The marinoids are indicated with an arrow to the right. So who are the marinoids? The marinoids are a diverse clade with nine families, 343 genera, and 3,382 presently known species, which have been largely understudied. They lack a morphological synapomorphy or universally shared trait and are named for their often brown coloration. In the last six months, we are beginning to unveil morphological trends among the marinoids. Commonly discussed morphological features in spiders include the claws, used for locomotion and silk manipulation, the palps located on the front legs used in male reproduction, and the spinnerets and crabellum used in prey capture web making. In this presentation, we will talk specifically about the crabellum, a plate at the base of the spinneret, spinnerets, which produces matted silk. On the left, we have matted cribblet silk, and on the right, sticky e cribblet silk. Spider webs are important for foraging, and there are many types suited to different niches. Under the right circumstances, criblet silk increases prey capture. The marinoids have both criblet and e criblet species dispersed across the clade, but it is unclear what is driving this repeated loss and gain of such an important structure. So what factors are likely to be causing the loss and gain of the cribellum? We hypothesize the following. First, pressures on prey capture and web structure as the ability to adapt between web types, evidenced by a gain or loss of the crobellum, might allow for the colonization of more diverse niches. Second, a preference for aquatic habitats, as the marinoid clade contains multiple salt and freshwater associated spiders, including the only fully aquatic spider, Argyroneta aquatica. And third, spatial factors. The marinoids are a globally distributed group with yet unexplored evolutionary patterns of dispersion, which could place pressures on the crobellum as well. Our project hopes to investigate these hypotheses through five objectives. First, is there a single or are there multiple evolutions of the crobellum? Second, does the loss or gain of the crobellum correlate with changes in web structure? Third, is there a single or are there multiple evolutions of aquatic association? 
Fourth, are there biogeographic patterns in the group? And lastly, does the bio biogeography and or timing of major evolutionary events in the group correlate with either aquatic association or crabellum gain or loss? My work this summer specifically was to design and populate a matrix of five characters for 98 exemplar taxa. These characters were the female crabellum, aquatic association, web building, zoogeographic location, and proximal distribution to water. To code the female crabellum, I used light microscopy, SEM, and photographs to code the character states for specimens in our collections and literature search for taxa that were not found in the collection. I coded the second and third characters using two sources. The first source I used was the World Spider Catalog, a compendium of all spider species descriptions. And the second was the World Spider Trait Database, a recent offshoot of the World Spider Catalog that deals with traits such as size, habitat, and foraging type. We will be uploading the data collected for this project to the World Spider Trait Database in the future. I coded for zoogeographic location using a table derived from the World Spider Catalog or used the NIH database of SRA sequence information to pinpoint the collection site of the specimen and correlate it to zoogeographic region. Finally, I coded for proximal distribution to fresh and salt waters, or in other words, what's nearby where a spider lives. Because it is uncommon to find this kind of information in the literature, I turned to another approach, utilizing the first 15 research grade iNaturalist observations and coding significant trends in distribution. In my analysis, I performed ancestral state reconstructions for each of the characters using the trace character function on mesquite with Bayesian inference. Finally, I performed time calibrations using the beast package. We used a clock model as well as three in-group and three out-group fossils. What percentage of taxa were able to be coded? Over 80% or more for all characters except proximal distribution. Next, we will return to address the objectives. First, is there a single or are there multiple evolutions of the crabellum? In our first ancestral state reconstruction for the female crabellum, we see that the ancestor of all marinoids had a crabellum and that it was lost in many groups. We see the crabellum completely regained in the family Dictinidae, pictured on the right. And finally, we also see some correlation between aquatic species and a transitional cribbler morphology shown in green and yellow, indicating that aquatic association may be related to the loss or gain of the crabellum. Does the loss gain of the crabellum correlate with changes in web structure? Though aquatic associated species appear less likely to use a capture web overall for foraging, there is no apparent relationship between web type and the loss or gain of the crabellum. Is there a single or are there multiple evolutions of aquatic association? The answer is multiple. There are five independent evolutions of aquatic association in the group. Additionally, there are at least two independent evolutions of halophytic or salt loving association. Are there biogeographic patterns in the group? Yes. There appears to be a paleoarctic origin for a large number of the marinoids and an internal group seen in yellow um, with Novo Zealandic and Australian origins. Does the biogeography and or timing of major evolutionary events in the group correlate with either aquatic association or crabellum gain or loss? Our time calibration tree produced divergence time estimates that place the origin of the marinoids at 53 to 57 million years ago. And the origin of the aquatic clade, including Saltonia, Parthuma, Chirea, and Ajironetta, at 4.4 million years ago. Unfortunately, the topology of the time calibrated tree is imperfect, which was somewhat expected as we use Sanger sequences, which can give poor support for the marinoids. Additionally, divergence times appear to be skewed close to present day. The most likely reason for this is that the available marinoid fossils are from more recent amber deposits. Because the fossils we have are recent, necessary next steps for the project are to repeat the analysis using tip dating instead of node dating, which requires extended morphological work to place the tips. Luckily, the morphological data we need to do this has already been collected. 
In conclusion, we found that there are multiple evolutions of the crobellum. No clear correlation between loss and gain of the crobellum and web structure. Multiple evolutions of aquatic association. A potential paleoarctic origin for the marinoids, not including Amarabiidae. An Australian and Novo Zealandic internal group. However, does the biogeography and or timing of major evolutionary events in the group correlate with either aquatic association or crobellum gain or loss? We don't know. There's still a lot to learn here. Without further ado, I want to say thank you to everyone who made this possible. Um, the National Science Foundation for their funding, the California Academy of Sciences for hosting, Dr. Franklin Kalarikome, Dr. Lauren Esposito, Dr. Rebecca Johnson, Dr. Ed Myers, and the Arachnology Lab, especially Jacob Gourneau, Sarah Cruz, Amin Al Jamal, and Kate Montana. And last but not least, all of the SSI, SSI 2023 cohort um, for being so wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Sophia. All right, questions. I see hands already. Thank you. Great job. Um, so you mentioned using iNaturalist in like the first 15 species. Were those just by like the 15 most recently research grade ones, the 15 most supported research grade ones? How did you pick those? That's a great question. To my knowledge, they were the 15 most recent research grade. Thank you. Right. Raina has a question. Um, that was really interesting. Thank you. I might have missed this, but I wasn't clear on how you tested for the correlation between the, I forget the name of the structure now, but the, the web type and the structure that helps make the silk. Yeah, absolutely. The crobellum and the web type. Yes, crobellum. Yeah, we compared um, different ancestral state reconstructions using like a mirror function on the Mesquite software so we could see them side by side. Ah, okay, so you ran them each independently and just looked to see if the nodes exactly. correlated. Okay, yeah. You mentioned there were limits to Sanger sequencing. What are the other uh, genetic genomic sequencing approaches that would be useful here? Yeah, I actually don't know, but I can get back to you on that. Cool. All right, I think, thank you so much, Sophia. <laughs> you can sit, you can sit down. No, you can sit. <laughs> um, thanks so much, everyone, for being here and for helping us um, at least celebrate our interns and hear about their amazing research this summer. Um, they all did an incredible job. So I want to take one minute to just give a round of applause for everyone today. Um, you all did a fab fabulous job. So now you can relax. Um, so thanks so much everyone for, for coming and supporting um, the students today um, and also supporting them all summer. Um, we couldn't, like we've said before, many times we couldn't do the SSI or have the SSI without everyone here at the Academy support. And so thank you so much for making it possible. Hang around, we have some celebratory treats. Uh, also, I really would like to have a current and former SSI photo. We gotta find Grace, she's in the building somewhere, I hope. Uh, so if you have been an SSI, don't go anywhere. Thank you. <laughs>